Hey everybody, what's up? I was starting to write like two different posts and I realized that it is just way too nuanced to try to do an entire post about this. So I just wanted to actually jump on, put this in video format. Um, it's gonna go a lot faster. It's gonna, I'm gonna be able to actually get all the nuance out there that I wanna get out instead of trying to type it all out and like move through this. So uh, the, the two posts that I was writing, one was on what does it mean to build a foundation building a foundation for our our lives here for our spiritual development and the second post that i was writing was on steps to move through a trigger and as i started writing it i'm like the this is complex it's more it's it's way more complicated than just if you're in freeze do this if you're in fight or flight do this hey what's up what's up my friends Hey guys. So thanks. He said he, he said he loves my hat. Chris said he loves my hat. Fun little fact about this before we get into this today. Um, I'm wearing a hat because I tried to do a banana hair mask last night. And let me just give you a little tip, a little hot tip, so that if you ever tried to do this yourself at home, Chris, I don't know if you're gonna try to do this at home, but maybe if your wife tries to do this, um, blend it, use a blender. Um, because I was picking banana chunks out of my hair for two and a half hours uh, last night and I still have some chunks in here. You can't see them. They've dried a little bit, but just a little word to the wise, uh, blend that shit, blend it to the, the heavens and then strain it. I think I'm a little freaked out. I don't know that I'm going to do it again anytime soon, but it's shiny. It's also a little greasy, which is why we have a hat on today. Um, he said it, it's also personal but in a hair mask. And honey, yeah, I added honey to it as well. The honey was fine, that wasn't the problem. But okay, so going back into what I was saying, um, I had somebody reach out to me and they said, you know, what does it mean to build a foundation? Because I mentioned that in my story, I said we have to have a foundation. You know, I'm sharing a lot of this information on my story, which is around decoding Kind of the mainstream agenda and matrix and these people and all this jazz and it's really easy to get uh spun out in it it's really easy to start to look to other people to tell us like who is what and this person's good and this person bad and like it can just be a little much uh and so this person was like well how do i build a foundation with myself and this is something that i'm just going to continue to probably come back to over and over again in my work because it's so incredibly important that we talk about this and that people have tools and understand like, what does it mean? We're just throwing around this word, build a foundation. There's people that don't even understand what that means. So to build a foundation is to build out the foundational aspects of our physical 3D life, the, the foundational aspects of having and living in a human body. And so that means what are we eating? Getting that fine tuning our diet for something that feels right for us, which is of course uh, subject to change as we change. Fine tuning and getting in touch with something like an exercise regime. So we're working the body. Um, our sleeping patterns, our nervous system, basic forms of regulation throughout the day. You know, I posted on my story just a couple minutes ago, I'm really trying to start to treat Instagram like it's a bad neighborhood where I get in, I have some exchanges with people that help me to decode certain things. I drop a little bit here and there and then I get the fuck out because I really have been starting to feel like I've been being cooked or microwaved uh, on this app and it's just you know, that's a foundational piece of my life that I have to get in order in order for these other things like discerning my reality and what's happening around me to be easier. Um, in order for me to actually be able to integrate and clear out this lower, you know, it's, it's if you want to think about it like the chakra system, this is like root level survival energy stuff. If we haven't dealt with the root of our being, our basic survival, our um, feelings of scarcity or powerlessness or 
feeling victimized by the world or helpless in some ways, right? A lot of this stuff is lingering trauma that's locked into the lower chakras of our body. We're living our lives from this place of survival and that is our foundation. So if this foundation is weak, then the spiritual house that we're building, our, that like our body is the spiritual house that we're gonna be anchoring in um, our own higher selves, our higher stations of identity into the body. And if the foundational pieces of the DNA of our day-to-day -day life is not in order, then the house that we're building on is going to be messed up. And if it's messed up, then that means that the structure is going to be messed up. And I think you get where I'm going with that. It's, it's going to lead to a lot of wonky things. It's going to lead to a lot of confusion, a lot of looping. Um, when we come into contact with this information that's asking us to see reality from a more expanded perspective. So very important, that piece. If you have any questions about that, or if you want me to say anything about that, just comment and then I will do that at the end. Um, but the second thing that I want to talk about that is like way too nuanced again for me to write a post about it is moving through triggers. And how do we actually do that? I want to give you as succinct, excuse me, of a manual, so to speak, for how to do that. So first of all, stop. Notice what's happening. Um, how in the body or how visceral the experience is. People say it's visceral because we're talking about the viscera. You know, usually when people talk about being triggered, what they experience or feel is their throat, their heart, their chest, their guts, this, this whole area. And sometimes people are not connected to that. And so what they are connected to is dissociation. That's still something that we can work with because that's the freeze response. We're out of the body. And sometimes we have competing impulses. So this is why it's nuanced. So we, we stop for a moment. We recognize, okay, what is happening? What can I sense? Doesn't matter how much or how little, what can I sense? And I'm going to give you a couple different examples of things that you might sense and what you might do with that. So let's say I notice that this is from personal experience. Let's say I notice my body is getting very hot. My heart rate goes up and then I feel myself almost like this glazing numbness happen, right? So you might think, well, which one is that? Is it fight or flight? Is it freeze? It's a little bit of both. So there's some activation creeping up in the system and then that activation tips us up and over into a dissociative freeze-like state. Right, because that freeze state is happening above fight or flight. Fight or flight is gonna be our first, actually our first line of defense is uh, ventral vagal interaction, which is person to person, to try to negotiate with, this, with the person in front of us with our words. If that doesn't work, or that has just been shut down, then we would go into fight or flight. If that doesn't work, and there's something like inescapable attack, or if it is learned, right? Because it doesn't mean that we're actually presently in an inescapable attack situation where we don't have access to fight or flight. What it means is that that's the pattern, that's the chronic pattern that our system goes boop, 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 trigger happens, and then it just goes through the sequence of events. And then we find ourselves, let's say, in this um, dissociative, freezy kind of state with where we're hot and the system is activated. So if this were the case where the person was experiencing both of these things at the same time, it is a choice point. It's up to you to start to be curious and work with your system. There is no um, like perfect manual to say, when this happens, do this, because I don't know. I would have to literally have you in front of me and see you. But you may know because you can feel into what's happening. Feel if there is an impulse. So first we stop, we notice what is happening right now. What can I sense? And then we feel for an impulse based on what it is that we're sensing. So let's say, um, and there may be competing impulses that happens. So feel into the one that feels stronger. So let's say, hey guys, I'm just gonna stop for a second and say hello. Um, let's say, 
in in this case the the impulse that's stronger is this rage this heart rate that's coming up right so i might go f feel into my body and let's say it's i want to run okay run imagine you don't have to physically just go out and start running um i think sometimes people have this kind of idea that when these these let's say the flight response is stuck in the body we would be completing incomplete nervous system responses every time we went for a run if that's how it worked but that's not how it works we have to be in the same triggered physiological state in order for the body to organically it's an organic process so the content comes up something gets triggered right and let's say it's it's flight so i might imagine running i might notice that my foot wants to do something i might notice that my arms or my muscles are activating right they might be tense and so I might feel my body, feel my arms, feel my legs. And with that, maybe moving my feet a little bit, I might get up and actually start to walk very mindfully while I'm imagining myself running. Now, give yourself sort of, sort of this, this image, right? Like imagine if a person is in freeze and they're trying to renegotiate this so that they can get back into the fight or flight response which like I said is below that, you're gonna to have to go back down through that most of the time in order to come back to some kind of a baseline. So, I mean, I, I think it, do, it has happened where somebody has jumped from dorsal vagal shutdown back into like in this freezy state, back into some kind of regular homeostasis, but it's, it's not as common, right? Usually we're gonna to have to go back through. And that survival energy can sometimes be a lot for people. It's like, whoa, right? I've been locked out of it for so long sometimes, especially if people have been living in that chronic freeze, that suddenly to have access to this life force energy, and it's really important that we frame this as life force energy and that we're not framing this as, um, you know, anxiety, panic, because that's a lot of time, it's, they're, they're right there on the same, you know, two ends of the same spectrum, just like excitement and anxiety. It's just arousal in the body. And a lot of times for people who have been living in chronic freezer, that's the pattern to go up into that freeze is that is going to frighten them. It's going to feel very overwhelming. Um, but if you have, you know, if you're, if it's here and you can work with yourself in these little tiny doses, or you can work with somebody like myself, in these titrated chunks, it's going to allow you to integrate it. And what we're doing is we're starting to uncouple the fear and the panic from that survival energy. That's why I say it's important that we reframe this so that your brain and body are signaling to each other, this isn't a bad thing. It's this energy that's coming back online through your body, which is going to allow you to escape the tiger, so to speak. It's going to allow you to get free. So... Right, so you feel into that, right? You might start running, not literally necessarily, but like I said, moving the arms, the legs a little bit, feeling for those impulses. And then we track. And we track what did that do? What was the impact that following that impulse through all the way through the body did, right? We don't wanna just keep going into the next thing and the next thing. We wanna allow that to land and integrate in the system how do you notice, right? We're, we're now when we're going, okay, I'm feeling a little bit of relief. I'm starting to feel a little bit of lightness in my chest. Notice anything that is going well. Notice anything that feels like relief and see if you can hang out with that for just a little bit longer. Just like we kind of want to hang out with those uncomfortable feelings, like when we might be getting that survival energy, that life force energy coming back online, and we can hang out with something that's uncomfortable so we can allow it to complete, we wanna kinda hang out with those good feelings too because we're dipping our toes into that counter vortex. We're dipping our toes and our body into what it's like to be on the other side of constantly living in a loop of being trapped by our own incomplete survival responses within the system. 
So that's one way that that could go, right? Okay, you notice what's happening, great. There's, there's some expansion, great, okay. Let's just notice that. Again, let it land. And, and there may be several waves like this that happen and you just want to stay curious and continue to follow your body's natural and organic rhythm and response. Now, sometimes, this is why it's important when we're dealing with really complex trauma within the nervous system and these really deeply embedded um, patterns, is that sometimes if you just let the body do what it's going to do, it, what it's gonna do is the pattern that it's used to doing and it's gonna get locked up in there. And so it can be really helpful to have somebody on the outside, especially if we haven't um, really kind of seasoned ourselves yet in being able to track our own sensations and track these impulses who can point it out to you outside of yourself and say, oh, okay, hey, your neck is getting really tense right now. I just saw your breathing rate drop. Um, that's an indicator, right, that the person might be going into freeze. And so we can kind of cue your system out of just going back into that habitual pattern because it might just do that thing and then get stuck there. So what we're after is curious observation and then wanting to have something new happen. And sometimes that means we're gonna have to be with things. I'm gonna say most of the time that means we're gonna have to be with things that we're not used to being with, but if we do it in a titrated enough way, that means in small enough chunks, then it's something that we are going to be able to integrate that way. So, hi baby. So let's say, um, a person doesn't go into freeze. They just go into this um, fight or flight kind of mode where, where maybe the muscles are getting ready to fight. Maybe there's just anger or rage that's coming through. A lot of times, another thing that's gonna happen is that once we start to go into that fight response, we allow that to complete. There might be, I wanna squeeze, right? Grab a pillow, grab something. You might notice jaw tension. You might There might be something that you wanna bite down on. Squeeze, push against a wall. Um, you know, push your feet into the ground. Something where you can have some kind of resistance to push or squeeze or bite. And a lot of times what I've noticed is that once moving through that, there will be some kind of an emotional release. And so that fight response was on top of that anger. It's like people who struggle with a lot of chronic anger are sort of keeping themselves afloat out of the vulnerability that's really underneath that because it might not have been safe yet to actually feel what's underneath that. So once that impulse comes through, there might start to be a shaking in the body. That's another thing that happens. And again, we just wanna stay curious with this. We just wanna notice, okay, there's a little bit of light trembling. That's great. That is the body discharging that energy. So within uh, somatic experiencing, within this kind of nervous system, foundationally, the foundationally structured work, we are putting pieces together that have been fragmented and this may be content, this may be memories, this may be um, actual, actual sequences that were disconnected within the body. And we're also uncoupling or taking things apart that don't belong together necessarily. So we might have shame coupled in with survival energy. We might have fear coupled in with survival energy or even coupled in with this, with this freeze. Right, and so we're, we're kind of taking things apart that don't need to be together and we do that through kind of expanding our capacity with these little chunks and letting ourselves actually move through these uncomfortable pieces. And we're putting things back together again, which again is part of that organic process of really being curious and witnessing what is happening as it's unfolding. And like I said, there might be a need for some kind of intervention with a practitioner if we're dealing with really complex trauma um, so the system doesn't just continue to loop. So let me see. There may be, um, like I said, there may be competing impulses. And when that's the case, 
feel into which one kind of kind of bookmark for yourself those two competing impulses you may even what we call pendulate or move gently between them so let's say there is an impulse to leave the body and then there's an impulse to be in the body you might just really gently feel yourself moving between those two things and notice what happens as you do that as you start to because that's enough that's in a way kind of bringing the connection back in between those two things. So when we have uh, one impulse, let's say, to leave and one impulse that says to come back, there's a disconnect between those two impulses. So as you're gently moving, what happens next? And then we follow that. What happens next? Okay, well, I notice... um, that there's kind of a middle ground. I recently was working with someone and this is something that we were working with. They found that middle place where they're not too far out of their body and they're not too in the body. Okay, let's notice that. And then there might be some relief in that. Okay, notice the relief, right? So there's so many different examples that I could give for how to actually work with the nervous system and how to work through these triggers. But I think the most important thing that I could give you in everything that I've just shared is to be curious. Curiosity is literally the antidote to shame. It's the antidote to locking ourselves up in some kind of a loop. So get really curious. Um, Notice what's happening as much as you can. Even if you're disconnected from the body, notice that you're disconnected from the body. There, even in numbness and the most associated states, there is something that you can notice. You can notice that you do feel dissociated. What does that feel like? Is there something about being dissociated that feels pleasant, right? And in that, that's another example. We might melt in the dissociation. We might start to orient, orient to your current space, which means to look around and examine, am I safe in this moment? Now, I understand that there might be situations where people are triggered and they're not actually safe in their environment. It's really pretty hard to heal from PTSD or complex PTSD while you remain in the environment that is continuing to traumatize you. So in situations like that, we're kind of just giving people coping, literal coping, which is very different from healing and actually completing and resolving these things. But we're giving people um, coping strategies so that they can get out of that situation into an environment where they are actually uh, safe so they can start to orient. That is bringing back in the present moment, which you don't have when you're in a triggered state. When you're in a triggered state, you are literally um, moving out of the present timeline and you are catapulted somewhere else. So trauma does that, right? It pulls us out of the present moment We are just not living in the now. And we're starting to bring those timelines and converge those timelines back together when we look around and we orient to the space. Okay, look around. Is there any, is there a tiger right here? Is there inescapable attack? Is there, no, okay. All right. Now we might be able to start to melt through some of that freezing that was taking place. And like I said, then what happens next? Then we might go into the fight or flight, which is underneath that. Um, We may actually just orient out and start to be able to stabilize from that. There might be some shaking because once we come out of freeze, that's when the shaking is going to happen. You see somebody go and... um, get hit by a car, let's say, crossing a crosswalk. Peter Levine has a great example of this in his book, um, In an Unspoken Voice. Uh, I'm reading that book right now, where he, I think after, I don't know, like 20 years of researching and doing this work, he had an experience where he was able to test it out in the moment. And he was crossing the street and he was hit by a car and You know, this is why I just want to do a little aside right now. This is why I'm so passionate about speaking about these things, because there's so many people in, let's say, um, you know, EMTs, firefighters, nurses, anestheticians, um, or not anestheticians, anesthesiologists who are 
working with the consciousness of oftentimes or working with the body and the nervous system of very traumatized people and they're not actually trauma informed in fact what he talks about in his book is that and i don't i, I believe that they're still doing this but they will uh literally give somebody like a thorzine or something to stop the body from shaking so you see these people who come you know they have these high impact car crashes and when their body starts to orient them a little bit and they start to come back the body will start to shake and they will strap a person down to stop them from shaking and that is a surefire way to make sure that somebody ends up with ptsd that happens you're going to end up with ptsd you let the body shake you let the body like what he talks about is the situation where he gets hit this person comes over and they're like, uh, you know, they kind of grab his neck. They're they're trying to, he's like, I'm an, I'm an off-duty EMT. You know, what's your name? What date is it? How? And he's like, just so like jarred by this. Like, uh, you know, like, dude, get off me. Like, what's happening right now? It was really overwhelming. And there was a really kind and compassionate face of a woman with this really beautiful smelling um, perfume who just gently kneeled down beside him. I wanna say, and he talks about this in his book, there is a spiritual component to healing. It's the kindness, not just this, right? It's more than just this, but it's a huge, huge piece of it. There is something about the kindness of another being witnessing us that allows the body, it's an anchor in a moment of confusion and disorientation. In fact, they have proven that in healing, it actually matters much less the modality that you're using and much more the relationship and rapport that you have with the actual client. If there is no safety in that relationship, there is very little ability to actually renegotiate trauma. So anyways, he, you know, this woman is like this island of safety for him and, and she, she holds his hand and and he squeezes her hand and she squeezes it back. And it was actually this link to kindness, softness, and compassion, right? You think about when somebody gets into something like, a, you know, people are frantic. Their own nervous systems are being activated by the fact that they're seeing this person laying in the street with maybe like a broken arm or something. And, and this woman's ability to stay calm and hold the container that is what we're doing, especially in these, I mean, I would say within therapeutic relationship, it's harder to do with yourself when you're in a frenzied state, but that's what we're doing. We're holding that container so that the being can naturally unfold and move through this. And that can really be a spiritual experience. And so he gets in the ambulance and he's obviously been trained for a long time to do this kind of stuff. And he's, but he's never had a live moment like this to really try it out and he's laying there and he he starts to everything starts to feel a little bit less foreign like when you go into a shock trauma no matter what it is you don't have to be hit by a car you know brutal abuse of any kind can cause the being to go into a shock state and so uh he he's back there and in the in Things are starting to seem a little bit less alien to him. He's starting to realize, okay, I'm in the ambulance. And he's holding on to this, this, the scent that he remembers of this woman, this kindness that he remembers. And his arm starts to, like he feels this kind of impulse for his arm to come up. And, and he remembers, boom, reconnection point. The image of his arm coming to shield his head from hitting the windshield and you can apply this to any kind of trauma right it doesn't have to be like i said that blunt force it could be somebody is lecturing me for hours and hours and i'm blacking out a little bit i can say that from personal experience and i want to run and get away right we're just tapping into what the body was trying to do what it wanted to do what it wasn't able to do so he puts his starts to put his hand up a little bit and then he realizes his other arm, his right arm wants to go out like this and he, boom, reconnection of the image of him um, going towards the pavement once he bounced off the hood of the car. 
and his hand again going to protect his head from hitting. And he, he, he had the thought, how amazing is it that my autonomic nervous system, my body in this automatic way is really going to try to protect the vital, the brain, which is so vital. And so boom, it reconnects and then the body starts shaking. And this shaking, you know, and it just let it happen. They didn't give him the Thorazine. They didn't try to, to try, you know, hold him down. And after that stopped, he, he looked at the woman in the ambulance and he said, well, I'm so glad to know that I'm not going to have PTSD now. And she said, what do you mean? And he explained what I just explained to you, that people who are not able to renegotiate this in the moment, this is what causes these triggers. This is triggers are emotional, physiological flashbacks to, to trauma and incomplete responses within the nervous system that cause fracturing within the personality structure and within the spirit. And so she's like, yeah, like we, we, you know, we tie these people down and stuff or like they, they, I know they do that at the hospital and he's like, yeah, I really, you know, there's people who basically are needlessly getting PTSD that they don't need to be if we just understood how this functions and how they came about a lot of this information was through watching people, uh, excuse me, not people, through watching animals in the wild. And I think that there is so much to be said for that because that is truly how we gain so much of our actual wisdom. I was watching this water flow over these rocks yesterday at this nature preserve. And I'm like, yeah, this is how, this is, this is like a visual representation of initiation of how we become soft how we how we soften it's through you know it's through this gradual process of being ran over with this water or with life and eventually those edges start to soften the same way that you don't notice the wrinkles forming on your face but one day you look back at this picture of yourself and you look really different the same goes for the way that our spirit our personality, this growth, hopefully if we're moving in a positive direction, it's this process of, of gradual thing that we just don't notice in the moment. But if I would have looked at those rocks probably 10 years ago, they wouldn't have been so rounded and so smooth. So how they uh, found out a lot of this information was through studying animals in the wild and what they naturally do. Like I said, um, Deer, after being hunted, will go into a cove and shake their bodies and they will reset their nervous system. And not only that, but they learn, right? They encode that information. They go, okay, this part of the forest, last time I was attacked by a mountain lion. So I'm going to be very careful if I go back in that area or I'm not going to go back at all. And imagine if animals who are constantly being um, hunted, if they did not do that, they would, I mean, imagine a deer with PTSD, that thing would not survive. It would just die. And that is quite literally what is happening to our human family members is that this trauma ends up becoming compounded in the body. And then we end up with chronic illnesses and diseases most of the stuff that we're seeing is literally just survival energy that has become calcified and locked up in the body. The waters of our spirit become stagnant and hardened. And, and that is literally what is causing so much problem. And it, it is literally, like I said, that animal wouldn't be able to survive and and that's what happens is that is that we we literally degrade. Um, yeah, there's so much more I could say on this topic, you guys, but um, it's probably going to end up being pretty long if I do that. So I am hosting a predator prey workshop on March 27th. Yes, at 11 o'clock Eastern. And I love this little stripe that we have going on here from the fucking blinds. Uh, Predator prey workshop. I'm gonna go over the the nervous system, so the, the physiological, the biological, the energetic, 
the so spiritual, the psychological, the emotional components of this, uh, all the different forms that it takes. We're gonna go through all of that in the lecture and then I'm going to do a live demo as I always do with a volunteer participant and show you guys real time. Like there's so many ways. What I love about the demos is that I never know what is gonna happen. I don't know how we're gonna do it. I just know that the person's there and I have a toolbox and a lot of times what I found with these demos is that I end up combining all three or you know all three of the modalities that I use and it becomes this really just cool unfolding. So whatever the person brings, it's gonna be different from person to person is what we work with. And then you get to witness this. So what I found is that even if you're not the person who's having the demo done on you, you get to witness how this functions. You get to see from the outside the whole thing unfolding, apply this fact to yourself. It's also a really great experience because from what I'm, I've heard from the people who have done these demos with me is that the group adds to the healing experience. It's like, I can understand, excuse me, I can understand in some situations how it might like, wow, like all these eyes are on me. But at the same time, I've heard people say they feel so incredibly held because these are like-minded people. Somebody who's going to show up to this kind of a workshop is doing this work. These are like, our, these are your freaking people. And they're there, they're holding that container. So there's a whole extra layer of healing. Um, and I really believe too, like being in that collective field, we are, we're amplifying the energy. We're working with it together. So if you're interested um, please do sign up. Like I said, March 27th. I think that's all. Um, yeah. I hope you guys have a beautiful day. This was, you see what I mean? How this could not have fit in a post. Like, how do you put this in like eight slides? Anybody got time for that? That's not going to work like that. Um, you know, better just do it this way. So thank you all so much for being here. Da, 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 da. Thank you all so much for being here. Sometimes I say things and I'm like, I'm just gonna go back and do a little waving. Yeah. All right, we got this you guys. Keep up the good work and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.